first or second day that it has begun that you need to be aware of. And that is, is that those of us who are seeking to uh, rectify the wrong, which is one of the attributes of the strangers, one of the attributes of the Ghuraba, those of you who are trying to rectify the wrong, you should try to refrain from complaining. And this is not one of the attributes of the Ghuraba, the strangers. Those things that are happening, those brothers that are responsible for putting these affairs together, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them and bless them for their intention and their efforts. And we find uh, on many occasions when we come to these conferences, we complain. We complain about this or we complain about that. In actuality, those ghuraba who came before us, who were the aghrab ghuraba, the most strangest of the strangers, meaning the Sahaba, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they didn't complain. And their, their circumstances and conditions, when they had their majalis and their halaqat, their, seat, uh, their sittings for taking knowledge and their circles of knowledge, their situation, as we already know, was totally different from this. And they didn't complain. And that's one of the reasons why they're ghuraba. They're the most strange of the strangers. And this is one of the reasons why we're far away from the ghuraba is because we're not concerned with the akhirah, we're concerned more with the dunya, and we want everything as comfortable as possible. So those brothers and sisters who have tried with all their level best to put these things together for this conference so that you can gain a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of knowledge from the people, unlike myself, who come from distant lands, from Egypt and from Arabia and from Jordan and from Pakistan and from wherever they come from, which is the opposite of the way it used to be during the time of the first Ghuraba of this nation of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet, where the people used to go to those people to learn, and they used to travel on camels and on donkeys and on horses and on boats, and would take them months and months and months and sometimes years to get to them. Now those people are being, being brought to you with air conditioning, with three meals, and we can go on and on and on. I'm sure that you brothers understand and the sisters understand what we're, talk we're trying to say. We should be satisfied with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We should be thankful to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. We should be remembering that we came here for the pleasure of Allah and to seek the knowledge of this noble deen of Islam and that those people who are conducting the affairs of this conference are trying their best. They didn't pay me to say this. It just came to me because of my own uh, misgivings that I have within myself and just thinking about some of the things that I and myself thought that I, maybe I should complain about. I just wanted to give that nasiha to myself and to you. And secondly, uh, Sheikh Basuni, he mentioned about learning the Arabic language. And at the end of this, inshallah, and it's not worth that much, but if you like, I will tell you how I began starting to learn the Arabic language, and inshallah, maybe that can give you some benefit. And I don't claim to have learned the Arabic language, but I do claim to be learning the Arabic language. Nonetheless, I can help, inshallah, to give some advice in, in those areas. Today, inshallah, we're going to be talking about Sifatul Ghuraba, the attributes of the strangers. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make all of us here of the Ghuraba. And we already know that the Ghuraba are Ahl Sunnah. They are Ahl Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah are Al Ghuraba. And Al Ghuraba are Ahl Sunnah. The people of the Quran and the Sunnah, the people who stick to the Sunnah and the Jama'ah, they are the strangers. And the strangers are they. But before we give the descriptions of Ahl Sunnah, I like to give a summary of Ahl Sunnah. And there's a lot of terminologies, a lot of explanations, elaborate explanations that have been given. But this is the one that I'd like to give in a nutshell from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. He said, Ahl al-Sunnah a'lamu al-Nas bil-Haqq wa arhamu al-Nas lil-Khalq. Ahl al-Sunnah a'lamu al-Nas bil-Haqq wa arhamu al-Nas lil-Khalq. That Ahl Sunnah are the people who are most knowledgeable of the truth. And they are the people who are kindest to the creation. 
If you don't have both of those characteristics, brothers and sisters, you're not of Ahlul Sunnah. They're the most knowledgeable people of the truth, of which many of us claim to be of and lean towards, and our endeavor to learn more about Islam, more about the Quran, more about the Sunnah, memorizing the Quran, memorizing the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the second part of Ahlul Sunnah we leave off. We're nasty to each other. We're unkind to each other. We're not considerate with each other. We don't tolerate each other. We backbite each other. We slander each other. We do all of the things that shows that we don't have the second quality of Ahl Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah, a'lamun nas bil haq wa arhamun nas lil khalq. Ahl Sunnah are the ones who have the most knowledge, the most knowledgeable people of the truth, and they're the kindest to the creation. And the creation includes the kuffar. And the creation includes the animals. And the creation includes the plants. All that except Allah is the creation. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once again to make us of the people of sunnah and to make us of the ghurbah. The meaning of gharib or the meaning of ghurbah, of strangeness, is very, very clear. Strangeness, brothers and sisters in Islam, for us, is a glaring, obvious treat. Because those of us who accepted Islam, in terms of the other people who have not accepted Islam, we are already the strangers. Just by virtue of the fact that we said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, we became of the ghurabat. We are the ghurabat. We are the strangers in regard to and relationship to the people who are of Ahl shirk The Ahl shirk and the Ahl kufr regarding our position, those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Ahl islam we are the strangers. But unfortunately, there is a smaller circle inside that larger circle of the people of Islam regarding the people of shirk and kufr, there's a smaller circle even among the Muslims. And this is the talk, inshallah, that we'd like to deliver tomorrow. The strangeness of the people of Islam as opposed to or regarding the people of the other religions and the strangeness of the people of the sunnah as regards to the Muslims and the other sects that have deviated. So we are strangers because we bore witness that there's nothing where they worship as a deed except Allah. Our belief alone makes us strange. We are the only ones in the world that bear witness that there's only one deserving to be worshipped. And everyone else, no matter what their beliefs are, they all fall under the category of kufr. And even if there were 30 people in this room right now, 29 of them kafirs, 29 of them mushrikun, 29 of them different ideologies and different creeds, Catholics, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hindus, Buddhists, Greek Orthodox, it doesn't make any difference what they were. And it was one out of the 30 that was Muslim, believing in Allah on the last day, you would not have 30 different aqidas. There would not be 30 different aqidas, there would only be two. The strange one, which is the aqidah of Tawheed, and the other ones, which all fall into the category of shirk and kufr. So those of us who elected or selected Islam, elected to be Muslims and selected Islam, we became strangers. We became those people, which is another strange characteristic for those who believe, we decided to make ourselves incarcerated. And this is why when we look at the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Al dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir," it seems strange even to us that the dunya is a prison for the believer and it's a paradise for the disbeliever. Even we, the Muslims, when we hear this hadith, 
I know, and Allah knows better, that it's strange to us. Why isn't the Prophet, why is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying we're in jail? Why? That's strange to us. It is because we can't do anything with what Allah has loaned us. With that which Allah has given to us as a loan, we are restricted in its utilization. We can't look at anything we want to look at. Like the other people of the other adyan, the other people of the other religions, they can do anything they want with their eyes. We can't eat or drink or wear anything. We can't sleep with anyone we want because we're strange. As for the other people, this world is their paradise. And they're free to roam in it as they please. Wherever they want to go, they can go. Whatever they want to do, they can do. Whatever they want to say, they can say. However they want to believe, they're free to believe. But for us, we're strangers. We're incarcerated. We're in a special housing unit called the dunya. And this makes us different from everyone else. That is the first aspect of the meaning of strangeness. The second aspect within that same category that we mentioned is the strangeness, which we'll elaborate tomorrow, inshallah, of the Muslims among the other Muslims. Those of us who, after accepting Islam, some of us among them going to the various phases of so-called Islam, neo-Islam, pseudo-Islam, quasi-Islam, those of us who came through the Moorish Science Temple, those of us who came through the so-called Nation of Islam, those of us who came through the Jamaat of Tablis, those of us who came through the, through the door of Tasawwuf, Sufism, those of us who came through the Qariyani, those of us who came through black nationalism, or whatever, then Allah, through His infinite mercy, had us graduate, had us graduate from deviance into the pure mainstream Islam. We left the nonsense and we came into the understanding that there were not two entities for our salvation, but there were three entities to our salvation. And those three entities is believing in the Book of Allah, holding tenaciously to the Book of Allah, Al-Quran, the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of which the other Muslims those who believe in Allah in the last day, they also try, and Allah knows best, to tenaciously stick to and hold to with their molati. But there's a third aspect, a third entity that makes us in that smaller circle more stranger than the Muslims in general with the kuffar. And that is, is that we try to stick to and we try to love and imitate and implement the understanding and the practical application of the Sahaba, of the Salaf of Salih, our rightly guided predecessors. And everyone has predecessors. The Kufar here in this country, they have a Salaf of Salih. They have unrighteous predecessors. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. Those are the unrighteous predecessors. But for us, we have the righteous predecessors. Abu Bakr, and Umar, and Uthman, and Ali, and the rest. Radwan Allahi alayhim ajma'een. May Allah be pleased with them all. So for us, we, who decided after the mercy of Allah was poured upon us, and the guidance of Allah was placed in our hearts, we decided to take the final, the next and final step to put all the pieces for lack of better words, to the puzzle, to become the strangest of the strange, to accept the way of a salaf of salih. And for that reason, accepting the way of the pious, pious predecessors, the Sahaba of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those two succeeding generations who followed them in righteousness and piety, trying to stick to that first generation, because of that, we become as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was asked, Who are the Ghuraba? Who are the strangers? He said, The Ghuraba are an Nuzau min al Qabail. 
They are the ones who extract themselves or divorce themselves or make hijra with themselves from their own tribes and people, the Muslims themselves. They are the ones whom we ask Allah to be with, inshallah. They are the ones whom when we walk into the masjid, when we walk into the Islamic centers, and we have our pants or our fowls above our ankles, we're strange. Or when we have henna in our beards, we're strange. Or because when we want to make the salah the way the Prophet and the Sahaba made it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those people who followed them in righteousness, we straighten the roads and we don't want to begin the roads until the roads are perfectly straight, we're strange. Or because we don't want to in the mall stand up and eat our food. We want to sit down like the first strangers. We're strange. Or because our wives want to cover their faces in a place that no one wants to cover their faces because they stand out as being strange. We're strange. And we can go on and on and on because we want to go with the moon sighting for wherever a Muslim sees it because that's what the Messenger of Allah said. We're strange, and we want to be weirdos. We want to be strange. We want to be those people whom the Prophet said, We want to be the people who get the Tuba. The Tuba and the scholars of strangeness, they differ, but both of those differences are correct. They say the Tuba is either a tree in Jannah of which the shade of the tree is one month's journey in the mode of transportation of the Prophet wasallam, of which the believers, the strangers, inshallah, may Allah make us of those, will take their clothing from that tree. The clothing of Jannah, the strangers will take their clothing from that tree, may Allah give it to us. And the second meaning of Puba is Jannah itself. These are the people who we want to be with. And these are the people who we want to be. We want to be of those strangers. And we don't care about the humiliation of the kuffar because we're the people of Islam and we're strange to them. Nor do we care about the humiliation, the repudiation, the revocation, the upbraiding, the chiding, the, dis the scorn, the disdain, the looking down at their noses from the other Muslims. We don't care because we're going to get pulled back. And this is the meaning, brothers and sisters, in short, of the strangeness. Among the strangeness, there are three types. There are three types of strangeness. The first of which we've already, we've already mentioned. The first is the strangeness of the people of Islam accepting the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first type of strangeness. And the people who don't accept Islam, they also are strange. They fall into that first category of strangeness. Listen again. The first type of strangeness are the Ahlul Tawheed. The Ahlul Tawheed. The Ahlullah. The Ahlul Rasul. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The people of Tawheed. The people of Allah, the people of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, as opposed to the other strangers who are in the majority. The other strangers are in the majority. And those are the people of shirk and kufr. Even though, brothers and sisters in Islam, even though those of you designed to be ghuraba, even though one of the descriptions, as we come to the second type, inshallah, of strangeness, one of the characteristics of the strangers is that they are small in number. They are qaleel. They are the ones whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that they live among the people nasun su kathir. They live among the people who are wicked and unrighteous, and the people who are wicked and unrighteous, they are in the abundance. And the people who try to rectify and correct 
and clean up and sanitize the evil and the wrong, the filth of shirk and, and kufr, they are small in number. So one of the attributes of the people of Islam is that they're going to be small in number. The ghuraba are small in number. And one of the attributes of the other strangers, the people of shirk and, tawhid, shirk and kufr, they are large in number. But don't be fooled by their numbers. Don't be fooled by quantity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was never ever concerned and is never concerned with amount. Yes, it is, it is good. It is meritorious to make 13 rakah, 11 rakah standing up at night. It is virtuous to fast as much as we can in the month outside of Ramadan. All of these things are good in terms of number. But Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Allah doesn't say, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَكْثَرُ عَمَلًا Allah says in his, in his book, in Surah Al-Mulk, it is he who created death and life to try you to see which of you will be best in conduct. The one who has the best quality of his deeds. Allah didn't say, it is he who created death and life to try you to see which of you will be most in conduct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bel aksaruhum la yu'minun. But most of them don't believe. Bel aksaruhum la yaqilun. But most of them don't understand. Most of them don't have any brains. So don't be fooled, brothers and sisters, by the majority of the people. Don't be fooled by the great numbers of the kuffar. Because the numbers of the kuffar, those who believe in shirk and kuffar, this is a trait for them, for their strangeness. And those of us who believe in Islam, we are going to be small in number but there's always going to be a small band of people among the Muslims who are going to be victorious. They're going to be victorious. You're going to find them in Anchorage, Alaska, two or three or four or five people that are trying to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah and the way of a Salaf of Salih. You're going to find them in Berbice, Guyana. One or two people when everyone else of the Muslims who took the Shahada just like you and me, they're going to be strange, sticking out like a sore thumb. You're going to find them in all the places that Allah created. Very few in number, but they are the ones who really want to stick to that which the Prophet wasallam brought. Let's give some examples, brothers and sisters, of the strangeness and we'll save the strangeness of the Jews and the Christians and the other kuffar tomorrow. Let's give some of the, some examples, one example or two, of the strangeness of some of the people who claim to be Muslim. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. This is a letter of one of the strangers who claims to be a Muslim or who they claim to be Muslim, like you and I believing in Allah in the last day. This is a letter from one of the prisons here in the United States of this particular inmate who is strange to us because of his belief. He says, the Holy Tabernacle Ministries was formerly the Ansarullah community established in 1970 in Brooklyn, New York by a Sayyid Imam Isa. The late Ansarullah community was originally established in Sudan, 1817, on Aba Island by Muhammad Ahmed, the great-grandfather of Imam Isa, who inherited the teachings and brought them to the United States. We'll stop there because I'm sure that everyone is familiar with this group. Listen to the next page. In 1992, we're talking about the strangeness of the other people. The Ansarullah changed its name to the Holy Tabernacle Ministry. The doctrine of the Holy Tabernacle is based on Nuabu. Nuabu is based on the eternal laws of nature. 
as, revealed, as revealed through science, past events, logic, and common sense, revealed as right knowledge, wisdom, and overstanding. Not understanding, overstanding. The Holy Tabernacle is a religion that embodies the best values of genetics, biology, anthropology, philosophy, economics, art, literature, and the health sciences. The Holy Tabernacle is a worldwide human movement for the survival, expansion, and advancement of the human race. It strives to unite all human peoples of the world on the basis of facts, regardless of race, creed, or language, regardless of race, creed, or language in a worldwide community. The Holy Tabernacle teaches that the Nubian race are the children of Elohim, or Allahumma. We honor our prestigious Anakwa, also called Elohim, who are our ancestors who came down from outer space from the planet Nibiru, and the mothership called Iliyun in the 19th galaxy from the 10th planet of that galaxy called Rizq. By way of the Orient skies on into this Milky Way galaxy, first making its residence on the planet now called Mars, originally called Lahmu. Our ancestors are the Elohim of the Torah who bred the first parents of the human race, Adam and Eve. My beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked, Who are the Ghurabah? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the Ghurabah are those Yasluhoon al Nas, or Yasluhoon Ida Fasad al Nas. They are the ones that rectify the truth that straighten out the affairs of the people when the people became corrupt. And another narration, either outside or not, when the people made things corrupt, the ghurabah, the strangers are the ones who went into the job and straightened it out, who sanitized it, cleaned it up, corrected the affairs. Another example of some of the strangers who claim to be Muslim, and this is also unfortunately found bringing up or having its roots in the prison systems here in America, a group called the Melanic Islamic Temple. The Melanic Islamic Temple. People claiming to be Muslims, and they stand up, and they say with their finger raised, I bear witness, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallahu sallallahu wa anna naturna nabiyullah. I bear witness that there's nothing worthy of worship as a deity except Allah Sulah and that Nat Turner, the freed slave from what century? Anybody remember when Nat Turner came about in America? That Nat Turner is the prophet of Allah. That Nat Turner is the prophet of Allah. So the Ghurabah among them are those people who have corrupted the Tawheed of Allah and they have corrupted the Book of Allah. And they have corrupted the way of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us by way of his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second type of strangeness, brothers and sisters in Islam, is the strangeness that is praiseworthy. That is the strangeness of those people, as we mentioned earlier, who desire to stick to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sunnah of his companions of whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us are the best of people. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَرْنِي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of people are my generation and then those who follow them succeeding them and then those who follow them succeeding them. We, inshallah, and we should say for those of us who desire to be ghurabah, sticking to the way of a salaf al salih we should say, yes, inshallah, I am of the ghurabah. Those of us who try to hold on to their way, 
we also have a strangeness. Allah. And that strangeness, as the Prophet وسلم, as we said earlier, said, that they are the ones who are nuzar min al qabail. They are the ones who even their families, their tribes, they have been extracted from them. They have been divorced from them. And you yourselves can probably give many accounts of those people, especially you Muslims listening to my voice, whose mother and father are Muslims, whose uncles and aunts are Muslims, whose brothers and sisters are Muslims, whose cousins, whose relatives are Muslims, you yourselves can probably give more accounts on how when you come to have family reunions or the like, you stick out like a sore thumb. You are strange among them because you are the ones who when your cousin, being a female, wants to shake your hand or wants to hug you, you push her away. You are the ones who when your family wants to have the 40-day walk after someone dies, the 40-day walk after someone dies, the reading of the Quran for 30 days after someone dies, or when you are invited to your parents' house or your relative's house or someone close to you in your family and they invite you to commit the innovation like praying 100 rakah on Nisla Shaban, you are strange to them. Because the sunnah has become bid'ah, and the bid'ah has become sunnah. The sunnah has become bid'ah, and the bid'ah has become sunnah. The sunnah is strange today, and the bid'ah is something that is accepted. So when we go to our Muslim school, and our children are in the classrooms learning Quran, and one of the children, six, or seven, or eight, or nine, after the recitation of the Quran, and the teacher and the rest of the class says, Sadat Allahu Azim. And one of them, six or seven or eight, stands up in the middle of the class with respect and says to the teacher, this is not from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is not from the, the Sahaba and their actions. And this is not from the Tabi'un. Even though he or she is six or seven or eight or nine years old, they're looked upon as crazy. They're looked upon as unscrupulous. They're looked upon as weirdos. They're looked upon as strange. This is the second type of strangeness. That strangeness that alienates us from the rest of the Muslims. And the third type of strangeness is a general strangeness that is e neither blame praiseworthy nor blameworthy, but can become with the intention and sticking to the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, become praiseworthy. And that is the strangeness of all of the Muslims who do not chase the dunya, but make the akhirah their desire and their aspiration and final goal. And to this strangeness, brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kun fit dunya ka'annaka gharib. Kun fit dunya ka'annaka gharib. Be in this world as though you are a stranger. Meaning, we don't desire to be of the world. We only desire to be in the world. And that's why when Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when some people came to his house after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, during the time of the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they noticed that he did not have any furniture in his home, how could an eminent companion of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam, one who was also known by having riches at one time in his life, they looked and asked him, why don't you have any furniture? Where's your furnishings in your home? He told them, this is not my home. It's a temporary place for me. My real home is the Akhirah. My real home is the next life. I'm only here temporarily. So this is the third type of strangeness, brothers and sisters. The third type of strangeness 
is the strangeness that Allah mentions in the Quran that تُؤْثِرُونَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى But most of the people, and this is the intent, this is the intent in the ayah, even though it's not found in the text, literally in the text of the ayah, this is the intent of the ayah. Most of the people, they desire the life of this world. But the other people, they know that the next life is better and it's more eternal. So that strangeness, brothers and sisters, for us, is we live as though we are just passing through. It's a temporary situation. We're not trying to cling on to our wives. We're not trying to cling on to our husbands. We're not trying to cling and hold on to as though with our last breath, our cars, our money, our clothing. Because we know, as Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, irtahalat al-dunya mudbiratan, wartahalat al-akhira muqbilatan, wa likulli wahidatan minhuna danun. فكونوا أبناء الآخرة ولا تكونوا أبناء الدنيا فإن اليوم عمل ولا حساب وغدا حساب ولا عمل علي رضي الله تعالى عنه said in this أثر صحيح collected by Imam al-Bukhari that these this particular world the dunya is fleeting and the آخرة is coming closer and closer the dunya is retreating, it's fleeting, and the akhirah is coming closer and closer. And both of them have children. So all you Muslims, be children of the akhirah. Don't be children of the dunya, because today there is actions without being held accountable. And tomorrow there is account without action. Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib, aw abir sabil. Be in the dunya as though you are a stranger or a wayfarer. And as Maluk ibn Dinar, rahimahullah, to warn us, one of the illustrious scholars of the second generation, may Allah be pleased with them all, to warn us, to make us aware and beware of the duty of the dunya. He said, whoever proposes, meaning proposes in marriage, to the dunya, then the dunya will ask as a dowry from that person its entire being. And it won't ask for anything less than that. Whoever proposes in marriage to the dunya, the dunya will ask of that person its entire being, Islam. That's all the dunya wants from you, your iman, your Islam. And it won't ask for anything other or less than that. So the third strangeness, brothers and sisters in Islam, is to live in this life but not be of this life. To live in this life but not be of this life. Not be of the dunya. Be of those people who are aware that this life is short and that we're not guaranteed to leave this room. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might take all of our lives at any moment and we try with all our level best to be strange when everyone else in this world is chasing nothing but that chasing nothing but that and one of the people whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah hates is the person who's jeevatun bil-layl himarun fin nahaf alimun bi amr dunya Jahilun bi amr al-akhirah. The ones who are a corpse at night. The ones who are a corpse at night. They spend all their nights sleeping. And they spend their days like a donkey working hard for the dunya. They're knowledgeable of the affairs of the dunya and they're ignorant of the affairs of the akhirah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people who are knowledgeable of the affairs of the akhirah and use the knowledge of the affairs of the dunya to get to the akhirah and make us of those who are not corpses at night outside of the month of Ramadan who stand up weeping to their Lord
crying to their Lord, asking their Lord to be of the strangers in this life, in this thinking dunya. And those people who work hard in the day for the akhirah. Because there are other people among mankind who ask Allah for this life. And in the next life, they won't get anything, no portion whatsoever. And there are others among mankind, and they're always, I repeat, always in the minority. One of the signs of the Ghurba. They are always of the minority. They are the ones who say, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسُنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسُنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابِ النَّارِ O oh, our Lord, grant us the good in this life and the good in the next life and defend us from the torment of the fire. What is the good of this life, brothers and sisters? What do the ulama of this deen, what do the scholars of this noble religion say is the good of this life? The good of this life, brothers and sisters, is to have knowledge of this deen, knowledge of this noble way of life, al-Islam, so that you may reach that place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for his righteous servants. Taking a little bit from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us of this material world, utilizing it so that we can get that great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no eye has seen and no ears ever heard and the mind of a human being could ever conceive. So with that, brothers and sisters in Islam, this is just some of the descriptions of the people who are strange. They are the people who are small in number among those who are large in number who are corrupt and they are those who when they are around the people who are corrupt whether they are the larger group of Ahl al-Kufr wa shirk the people of disbelief and polytheism, or whether they are around the people of Islam, but in the diversing sects, the people who have deviated from the mainstream teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they correct the wrong. They are those who correct the corruption whenever they meet it. They meet it head on, and they will always be small in number and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those people. We ask you all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by your greatest name, to make us of the ghuraba. And we ask you all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make us of those people who will be in the closest proximity of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of resurrection. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahabihi wa sallam. Uh, we're going to start some questions. If you want to bring some questions, write them down, or uh, you're welcome to speak, I think. If I'm understanding the question properly, I think the brother is asking, and correct me, inshallah, if I'm wrong, how do you differentiate between the people alienating you because you're trying to stick to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way of the salaf of salih, a rightly guided predecessors, and, what did you say? and you're thinking that you're doing something right and you're actually doing something wrong. So the question is? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, this is very simple. The brother's asking the question, inshallah, it's very simple. The brother's asking the question, how do, you, how do you differentiate between the, the general alienation of the people of Islam for you practicing the Qur'an and the Sunnah and sticking to the Qur'an and the Sunnah as the companions understood it and practiced it and you are also alienated in general when you think yourself, you yourself you think that you are following the Qur'an and the Sunnah but in actuality you're making a mistake. How do you differentiate between that being pray, blameworthy, praiseworthy, and blameworthy? I think this is what you're saying, right? That's very simple. It's similar to, it's similar to, how do you know if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing you or punishing you? How do you know? It's similar to this. The principle is similar. How do you know when Allah is testing you as opposed to Allah is punishing you? You know by your actions. You know what you've done. If you haven't done anything wrong, you know it's a test. 
If you've done something wrong, we know you're being punished. Likewise, your alienation from the people is not the, is not the concern. Once you find out that you are practicing something other than the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the guidance, which is the best guidance of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, once you find out, there's, there should be no concern with the alienation because you're going to be alienated no matter what. You yourself, within yourself, are going to be the determining, the deciding factor of why you're being alienated. But having the alienation from those people and trying to figure out why is really of no concern whatsoever and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The important thing is, is that we stick to that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and we try to make sure that what we are doing is from him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we won't fall into that confusion. Wallahu al Okay, we received some... Uh questions from the sisters, but we need to keep it as much as possible pertaining to the topic. Um, so, let's, uh, so keep, keep them coming anymore from the brothers. Yeah. Also, brothers, if you have any, just go ahead and pass them up. Yeah, this is a, I wish that the question could be uh, over the microphone so that I won't do a disservice to the people who are asking the questions and not saying what they're saying exactly. So may Allah give me the help uh, and the success to repeat what the people are saying exactly or get close to it, inshallah. He's saying that there was a talk this morning uh, on the subject of the difference between the oddity and strangeness. He said, for instance, when in certain places here in this country and also in, other, in Muslim countries, if a Muslim were to go into the masjid with their shoes on, <clears throat> he might run the people away from them. He might run the people away from them. Uh, and this is in general. Trying to practice the sunnah today, of course, as we mentioned, is something that's strange because the majority of the people of, of Islam today, they don't know what the sunnah is. The person has to exercise wisdom. The person has to know when to apply those things that are going to seem strange to the general Muslim. If you know that the majority of the Muslims don't know that it's permissible to stand in the masjid with your shoes on after you've checked them, which is an important point, because some of us don't follow the sunnah all the way through. We just walk into the masjid without checking our shoes. Once, you, once the people see you walking into that masjid and they know that you are one of the strangers, inshallah, it is from the wisdom of yourself to remove your shoes even though it is a part of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you don't want to cause a greater harm in running the people away. One of the brothers and his brother, his blood brother, where I'm living now in Kansas City, Missouri, was saying that in Syria, when they were young, younger men, they went into this masjid that was predominantly a Sufi masjid. And they said the masjid was packed. The masjid was packed. And they knew it was packed before they even got into the masjid. They said because in front of the door, there was literally hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes. So they came into the masjid in their youth, not really knowing how to apply, using the hikmah, the wisdom of what they wanted to correct in the wrong. And the big Sufi Sheikh, as he was speaking, for an hour or two or whatever, he was using an abundance of forged and fabricated narrations, attributing, to, attributing them to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they had made their way up to the, uh, close to the Sheikh, the Sufi Sheikh. So after the talk was over, they raised their hands and they said, Sheikh, we, we have questions. And they said, Sheikh, Tafadbal, yes. They said, you cited, and they started enumerating, started counting all of the hadiths 
that were unauthentic. You know, this hadith is spurious, this hadith is forced, this hadith is fabricated. They said the next thing they knew, and it was a window behind the sheikh in the masjid. It was a window. They said the next thing they knew, they were literally diving through the window and piles of shoes were coming behind them. They, the two people just picked their shoes up and just started throwing their shoes at them. They were being hit upside the head and, they're just, oh, and they fell. Some, he said one of the brothers fell. He was tumbling in the street. And the shoes, just, like, just hundreds of shoes. So this is wisdom. It's not wisdom to do certain things even though it's the truth, even though it's part of the sunnah, even though we know we're going to look strange. It's strange. We have to know when to apply these as sunan al as sunan al majhula We have to know when to apply these lost, abandoned, and unknown sunnah. This is very, very important. The hikmah of the Muslim, knowing when to apply something, is extremely important, brothers and sisters. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not make us odd, but to make us strange. Amin. Our dear brother, the Uladib, how should our relation be with the kind of people, with this kind of people, the majority who alienate us? Uh, the answer to this is in the surah that Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he has mentioned that if this was the only surah revealed, it would have been sufficient for the people. And that surah, of course, is wal-asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladheena amanu wa amilu al-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Surely every single human being is going to be at a loss. They're going to be in a deficit. They're going to be losers. They're going to be bankrupt in the next life. Except those who believe properly and do righteous deeds. Righteous deeds meaning with a pure intention and accordance, in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. And those who enjoin and exhort and encourage and incite one another to the truth. When they're given the dawah, when they're giving the dawah, and they exhort and encourage one another to being patient and persevering in the harm that they're going to receive when they're spreading this noble way and this noble dawah. So we should be patient and persevere with the alienation and the harm that we are going to receive as an occupational hazard. It comes along with the turf. If you want to practice the Quran and the Sunnah, and stick to that way, the way the companions understood it and practiced it, then you have to expect to be humiliated. You have to expect to be harmed. You might even expect to be physically harmed, and in some rare cases, because of the extreme deviance and misunderstanding of some of the Muslims, you might even expect to be killed. Wallahu mustaan. Okay, we're getting a whole lot of questions, but very few pertain to the topic. Remember, the topic is the characteristics of the strangers that he has explained. Uh, we're getting many that are not from that. And yes, that's right, that's right. We only use the microphone to be able to play. Yeah. Young. The brother is uh, asking the question, and he's using the terminology that, that, some, that most of us, I would like to say, uh, probably are familiar with, but we should be aware that there are people who come to these conferences who are not familiar with the terminology Salafi. Don't think that everyone who comes to the Quran and Sunnah Society conferences understand or, fami or are familiar with the word Salafi. The brother is asking, what is the advice that you can give? to those young Salafis here in this country who don't have a lot of knowledge, 
which is the majority of us anyway, in enjoining good and forbidding the evil among ourselves. Is this the question? And I would say, in short, that while seeking that knowledge, that we should take a look at ourselves more than we should look at anyone else. And we should remember that the prophets of Allah, when we go to them, alayhim as salatu was salam, when we go to them for intercession, Adam, Nuh, Ibrahim, Isa, Musa, Isa, those prophets of Allah, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us they are the best of people. The best of people are the prophets. They themselves will say, they themselves will say, Nafsi, Nafsi. I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for myself. If we keep that in mind, those of us who love this noble da'wah, the da'wah of haq, the da'wah of the truth, the da'wah to the Qur'an, the sunnah, and the way of the salaf of salih, those of us who like, no, who love to call ourselves in the face of adversity especially, I'm salafi, those people should remember to look at themselves. When we're seeking this knowledge, we shouldn't be so quick to find fault in our brothers and sisters in Islam because just a few days ago, you were just like them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, بَشِّرُوا وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا يَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا Give glad tidings, bring good news, and don't run the people away. Be easy and don't be harsh. Remember, أَهْلُ السُّنَّةِ أَعْلَمُ النَّاسِ بِالْحَقِّ وَأَرْحَمُ النَّاسِ لِلْخَلْقِ أَهْلُ السُّنَّةِ دَعْوَةُ السَّلَفِيَّةِ The people who are Salafiyun, they are the most knowledgeable of the truth, but they're the most merciful and kindest to the people. The people who are really of the Sunnah are the people who try to find excuses. The people who are not of the Sunnah are the people who always try to find fault. Those are true characteristics, true to form, inshallah. Okay, go ahead. Would you say that again? Would you that? Uh, the brother is asking the question about the the issue of a zuhud or the issue of a tazkiyah of purifying our souls and our hearts and cleaning up our actions and making our moral character uh, the best that we can make it inshallah and those spurious uh, fabricated forged narrations that pertain to them I believe he's saying is it possible that we can elaborate and I would not like to do that uh, we have people here alhamdulillah we have Sheikh Ali Hassan Al-Halabi, Abdul Hamid Al-Halabi, Al-Athari, who is one of the premier students, as we know, of Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin Al-Albani, and his area is Hadith, specifically. We also have one of his premier students, Salim Al-Hilali, Abu Usama, Salim Al-Hilali, and we also have Sheikh Abu Ishaq Al-Hawaini, and I would like to leave those questions for those people who can take, as they say, among the Arabs, Give the bow to the man who knows how to curve it. You know the bow now? Give the bow to the man who knows how to curve it. And I'm not one of those individuals. So I'd like to leave that for those people, inshallah. Okay, this question says, uh, there are times when the wife is a stranger to the husband. And, um, you know, it's and obeying, and obeying him? How do we reconcile this? No. I was a little 
Subhanallah wa bihamdihi Subhanallah al-Azim This is a very good question This is a very good question uh, And we find this happening We find this happening a lot In fact And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala A'lam Allah knows best uh, we, I find it not, we, I find it more than not Than the other way around We find the women now The women Becoming gharibah Becoming one of the ghoraba trying to stick to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the way of a Salaf of Salih and the husband not. In fact, I know a sister who comes to this conference regularly and I don't know if it's still the case, but from what I remember her husband, she always is accompanied by him, alhamdulillah her husband is a Sufi and she's Salafiya. She's Salafiya and her husband Sufi to the best of my knowledge. But I've been seeing him a lot during these conferences. I didn't see him in this, this year's conference we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help any sister who has that situation. In short, when a person, a, a Muslim, a Muslim woman, has that case where she's trying to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah, and she's praying, and she's fasting, and she's enjoying in the good and forbidding the evil, but she has a husband who is lax in his prayers, or he shaves his beard, for instance, or he wears his clothes dragging on the ground, or any of those things and other things that don't come to my mind, we would say that that woman, and please be careful, don't take my words, I'm not making tech fear. I'm not making tech fear. I'm not saying her husband is a capper. I am not saying her husband is a capper. I am not saying her husband is a capper. But I am saying that the people of Islam in regards to the people of the other religions are like the people of the Sunnah as regards to the people who are Muslims who have deviated. And that woman is Ahl Sunnah in her house. And her husband, if he is not following the Sunnah, he is Ahl Dalala. He is of the people of error. But she still has to obey her husband. And she still has to respect her husband. And she still has to give respect to her husband. She cannot be disrespectful to her husband. She cannot leave off her obligations to her husband. She has to fulfill his rights. And that, brothers and sisters, is in general. That is in general. And I don't want the person who sent this up to take that answer and stretch it like a rubber band and apply it to their circumstances. That is in general and we need to ask the ulama of Islam here who are among us to give the details to that sister or any woman who has that problem. The brother has his hand up. Well, the brother has his hand up first, inshallah. Uh, if, this, if the issue is vice versa, and the man is one of the strangers, and the woman is not, it's much easier. Because in general, the women are not responsible for their own affairs. The man is always the imam. Whether he is following the sunnah or not, he's still the emir. So it's going to be an easier situation, unless his wife is a lewd, corrupt, unscrupulous individual, then he has to take another recourse. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Salam. Alaykum salam wa I'm not uh, fully understanding the question. I, he's asking the, I think he's asking how do we distinguish between or how do we gain uh, success between uh, being strange, specifically he's saying, like, or I should say, like in our appearance, being strange in our appearance, and at the same time, 
uh, the narrations that talks about people who in their appearance it makes them have the air of being proud or arrogant being proud or arrogant uh, I wouldn't know how to answer this question properly because I don't see really the relationship between someone in appearance we're talking about now who walks with their salve or their clothes as a man as a man which is actually the way the women should be dressing with their clothing beneath their ankles or even dragging on the ground and those people who are trying to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam those men that is and wearing their lower garment up above their ankles I don't see the relationship so I'm not really able to answer this question but I would like to say that this strangeness brothers and sisters don't don't think that this strangeness is only in clothing we don't want to give the, uh, the, the idea that the strangeness of the strangers is in clothing or physical appearance. Not just clothing, but physical appearance. That is part of the strangeness. That is part of the strangeness. In fact, when Sheikh Ali, uh, Habibullah, Sheikh Ali Hassan, who's with us today, when he was asked, what advice do you give for those brothers who are sticking to this, this, this dawah? What advice would you give for those brothers who are trying to stick to this dawah in America? He gave two pieces of advice. Number one, that along with learning aqidah, making it a priority, we should learn the Arabic language. And number two, you should make sure with all your level best that you have the outward appearance of Islam. The outward appearance of Islam. We're not saying, though, that just because we dress like this, that we are going to be of the strangers even though that is one of the small aspects one of the small aspects of the people who are strange because definitely brothers and sisters how you look has an influence on how you think what you wear will have an effect on how you think but we're not saying that it's relegated or centralized just to outward appearance because the person who is kind to the person who wrongs them, that is an attribute of the Ghurba. Allah says, Idfa billati hiya ahsan. Repel the evil with that which is better. You want to be one of the strangers in action? When the brother wrongs you, forgive him. When the sister backbites you, forgive her. Follow up the evil deed with a good deed. When they say something about you or do something against you, follow it up with something good and you will become one of the strangers you will become definitely one of the people who's going to be looked at as strange because very few people today brothers and sisters can lower the wing of humility and mercy to their brother and sister in Islam very few of us it's very difficult for us that when another Muslim wrongs us today that we don't retaliate with something that is equal or worse very very difficult Wallahu Musta'an Okay, uh, keep in mind that we do have a lot of questions here and there's going to be probably an open panel for just taking a lot of questions. Uh, we're about to run out of time here. Uh, we can take, uh, we got one more. Go ahead. Uh, the brother's asking, and I think this is the final question. The brother is asking what we have mentioned earlier about some tips on learning the Arabic language. Uh, and uh, coupled with that, how I began in my Arabic studies, uh, which I don't think is really relevant, uh, but if someone wants to know, I'll say it. Uh, but some tips that I would say I would recommend for learning the Arabic language after what Sheikh Bafuni had mentioned keeping your niyyah pure and clean for the pleasure of Allah trying to learn that Arabic so that you will not be a show off or compete with the scholars or take over the majlis meetings and the halakat I would say that the second most important and Allah knows best is to be consistent I know brothers who have been, been Muslims as long as myself or longer they've been studying on and off the Arabic language and they're still at the same spot or just a little bit above that 10 years 15 years 20 years 
and they've been not through or have not through but have studied from two or three or four or five different types of books to learn Arabic. One of the main, one of the, one of the key ways to learn the Arabic language is to be consistent. You have to do it as much as you can. And you have to make sure that you push yourself to learn how to read the Quran properly. Because once you learn how to read the Quran properly, it will strengthen your tongue. And it will be an aid for you to learn the Arabic language. And with that also, as Sheikh Walid said, don't think that Arabic is just grammar. Some of the brothers, unfortunately, think that if they study grammar, they have Arabic. If they can read without vowels, that's it. That's it. They've completed the Arabic studies. No, Arabic is very wide. There is nahu. There's grammar. There is sarf. There's morphology. There's balagha. Uh, and balagha is difficult to translate. Uh, eloquent rhetoric. There is... Uh, Adab, there is share, there's poetry, there's all types of disciplines in the Arabic language in the study of the Arabic language. We have to learn as much as we can and be consistent, and we, if we can as a tip, should try, inshallah, to identify those brothers and for the women, those sisters, who, number one, are not just Arabs, but those people who have a love for the Arabic language as a discipline. And I don't want to step on any toes for any of the Arabs that are sitting here right now. But my measuring stick, this is my own personal measuring stick, my own personal measuring stick for the Arabs that are good in Arabic in general are the ones that got good marks in school when they were in their countries. Usually when you find the Arabs getting good marks in school, or even more than that, they have a bachelor's or a master's or PhD, in general, you'll usually find those people are good in Arabic. Not because of the degree, but because in general, the Arabs don't like to study Arabic. The Arabs don't like to study Arabic as a specialized discipline. They like to go into other areas. When you find an Arab who specialized in Arabic, at most, or at least got good grades in Arabic in junior high and high school, try to stick with that person. And inshallah, you'll gain some benefit. Or someone who is non-Arab, who has some, uh, has mastered somewhat the Arabic language. And lastly, I would say that you should try to make sure, if at possible, if at all possible, that you study your Arabic with a person who is, and I'm not ashamed to say it, sound in Aqeedah. They're sound in Aqeedah because, in my conclusion, if you find someone who has a warped Aqeedah, they can, they can corrupt you by way of the Arabic language. By way of the Arabic language, without teaching any classes of Aqeedah, they can corrupt your understanding of Islam through the Arabic language. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I think they called the adhan, so we don't want to stop for any more questions or anything. Let's rush straight to the hall where we're going to pray. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.